start. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Feed Your Mind session hosted by the Alpha Sigma Nu Alumni Club in Houston, Texas. I'm Andrea Cuervo Prados, and today you will feed not only your mind, but also your heart and soul by learning from who I consider one of the rock stars of leadership and decision making, Mr. Chris Lau. I've posted Mr. Launi's bio in the chat for you to discover more about his outstanding work, passions, and of course, contributions. After Mr. Launi's presentation, we will have a Q&A. So you can type your questions in the Q&A section or click on the raise hand icon to ask a spoken question. You also have some instructions in the chat. I will repost them for the ones who just arrived. Before moving forward, I would like to thank Alpha Sigma Manu, particularly Amy and Clara, for making this event possible. Truth be told, Mr. Launi doesn't need an introduction. We all know that it is a privilege and an honor to have him with us today. Mr. Launi, welcome to this Feed Your Mind session and my deepest gratitude for sharing your knowledge, kindness, presence, and of course, lunch time with all of us. So, leadership in the VUCA world, how the Jesuit stuff can help. Um, okay, thank you, Andrea. So, um, I presume you can hear okay? Just tell me if you cannot. Um, and I guess the first thing I would say is, uh, when you introduce me by calling me a rock star, then you're setting people up for a big disappointment because this will not be a rock star sharing, I can promise you. And um, uh, I must thank you, uh, Andrea, for um, leading the way to set this up and Amy, uh, with whom I've worked a lot um, over, over a great period of time. Um, and with that, Andrea, why don't you uh, share the first, um, slide, the title slide. And Andrea is gonna be helping me with the slides. And the first thing I'll say before we go any further is you'll see there's all my contact information, uh, including my email address right at the top. And I'm very happy to uh, be in touch if you wanna carry on a dialogue by email, or if you want the PowerPoint, you're very welcome to have it. You're very welcome to use it. Some of you maybe are managers of uh, small teams. And if you want to take pieces of what I do and do them with your own team, that's most welcome. And uh, the instructions uh, Andre gave me was uh, to talk for about a half hour. So that's what I'll do. Um, and then we'll leave the rest of the time for questions and observations and so on. And why don't we go to the next uh, slide, uh, Andrea. And if we were doing this in person, I would ask for a show of hands now. Let's think about the world today. Let's think the world 15, 10, 20 years ago. Uh, do you think the world is faster paced? Is it more complicated? In the course of running your life or organization, do you have to cope with more change or make more decisions? And I don't need to see you raise your hands because I know what the answer is. The same answer that Whenever I give a talk, whatever is the industry, whatever is the country, and I've been in a lot of industries, a lot of countries, people always feel the same way. 90% plus will say, it's a stupid question. It's way more complex, uh, much more change, uh, much faster paced. And indeed, I, I think it is. And uh, on the next slide, Andrea, the um, military in the US has given us a handy little acronym for describing the kind of world that, that we're living in. They tell us that we're living in a world that's VUCA. It's volatile, you, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's ambiguous. And, you know, the military came up with this acronym in the course of training officers who are gonna be plopped down in the middle of battle zones. And they wanted to convey to them what it felt like to be in the middle of battle. 
confusing, lots of things going on, hard to see what's coming next, having to change your approach quickly in response to enemies and so on. And I find it very ironic that this acronym uh, initially coined for people going into battle seems always completely relevant whenever I talk to people, whatever is their organization or business. They say, yes, this is my world. This is my world. There's too much going on. It's too volatile. It's complex and, and so on. And I start out that way and I start out almost all my talks that way these years, these months, because I feel that VUCA has enormous implications for leadership. And I'm going to be teasing those out a little bit. And to give you a punchline, I also feel that what I call in a kind of playful way in the title, the Jesuit stuff, actually gives us some wonderful, what we might say, competitive advantage for life in a VUCA world. And, you know, that's something that is incredibly relevant for people in Alpha Sigma Nu, and I think uh, incredibly optimistic and positive for people in our world. Now, you know, as long as we're talking about Alpha Sigma Nu, I suspect that for most of the people on this call, it's not just the plain fact of VUCA, it's not just that things are changing a lot, it's the nature of the change. And let's go to the next slide, Andrea. And I jotted down, I'm not gonna read through them, a handful of some of the trends that we're afflicted with as a society, what we might call some of the negative trends. And I guess if I had asked you all uh, to jot down some of uh, your ideas about what is some of the VUCA, you might mention some of these things. Um, so, you know, the, the first important thing we might think about is, yeah, I mean, we're living in a world that's uh, changing a lot and it's changing in ways that we don't actually feel very good about often. And in those kinds of environments, leadership is really important. And don't count on my word. Uh, rather, I'm going to show you on the next slide, Andrea, uh, part of the summary of a consulting project that the accounting firm Deloitte did. And they uh, went out and interviewed a lot of their corporate clients and they asked them about leadership. And now let's uh, focus on a couple of pieces of this conclusion that Deloitte came up with. Uh, so one, the first paragraph, 80% of respondents, 80% of corporate clients rated leadership a high priority for their organizations, but only 40% more or less told us that they or their organizations are ready. So don't keep reading, just think about that for a second. I mean, it's an incredible statement, you know? I mean, it's as if, uh, so I'm on the board of a big hospital system. It's as if we said something like, you know, for us to succeed as a healthcare system, we need really outstanding nurses, and we do. But you know something? 60% of our nurses suck. I mean, this is what these corporations analogously are saying to us about the quality of leadership in their own enterprises. And, you know, um, let me tease out another idea or two from this. One, uh, I think this opens a wonderful door for uh, graduates of Jesuit schools, for people in Alpha Sigma Nu, because, you know, if you look at the uh, ethos, you know, the way your institutions describe themselves, the way Alpha Sigma Nu understands what it's for and what it's doing, you talk about the notion of forming leaders, becoming leaders, taking advantage of leadership opportunity. And so in a way your Jesuit Alpha Sigma Nu uh, heritage and tradition is playing beautifully into one of these uh, core needs of society and, and organizations. And the second paragraph, I won't go through in detail, but uh, I'll just um, invite you to look at the words that jump out of that paragraph 
And a lot of them are VUCA words, evolve, rapidly evolving, technology-driven, ambiguity, complexity, and so on and so on. So the second paragraph, in a way, kind of explains the first. It kind of um, validates what the way I tee things up. In other words, we get into a very complex time and leadership really becomes important. Now, if we were all together and we had more time, I'd say, all right, why don't we have a little uh, uh, quiet meditation and discussion group? And because we don't have time for that, I'll invite folks while I'm talking, if you wish, to jot an idea or two into the chat box. And specifically, I'll invite you to um, jot, for example, the name of a living person that you'd consider to be a good leader. And then also, why do you think of such names? So you can also jot in the chat box if you wish the qualities, personal qualities, personal attributes, personal characteristics of someone you'd consider a good leader. And I'll give you just three or four quiet seconds to think about that. And if you wish to jot down ideas, and then I'll continue along. So um, I don't know what ideas are going through people's minds, but I wonder who's thinking of their own name when I say think of the names of leaders. I guess nobody next to nobody. You know, we're, we're raised in a culture that teaches us to be modest, humble people. And um, in fact, modesty, you may know, correlates well with effective leadership. So the modesty is important. But I want to suggest to you that if we understand the idea of leadership well, uh, the first people we need to think about as leaders are ourselves. So if you think of Barack Obama, Pope Francis, uh, Elon Musk, whoever you think of, instead of thinking only of super famous celebrities, we need also to think about ourselves. And one of the ways I would justify that, that point would be uh, if you look in the dictionary, you would find uh, this among the definitions of the word leadership, something like to point out a way, direction, or goal and to influence others toward it. And isn't it true that everybody here is doing these words all the time? We're not like holding a sign and pointing the way, but you know, by virtue of uh, how we treat other people, what values we actually role model, how we spend our time, how we spend our money, work as competitors or people we want to collaborate with, and so on and so on. This is like pointing out a way. We're implicitly having influence as if we're saying to other people, this is the way human beings ought to behave and live. And you know, I asked you to think of qualities you associate with leadership. And if everybody had written out their qualities, I would strongly uh, guess that probably 80% of the ideas you came up with are ideas that you yourself could role model. People are probably thinking about qualities like uh, to have integrity, uh, to listen to others, um, to be able to motivate yourself and others, uh, to um, have some sense of direction about where to go and so on and so on. All of them ideas we could embody. So this really is my core idea. Um, uh, the most fundamental takeaway is that in a time of VUCA, leadership is really important. And we need to understand that life is giving each of us some kind of leadership opportunity and responsibility. And on the next slide, Andrea, um, some of you know that I wrote a book that takes uh, stories from the early Jesuits who are like leadership. And I tried to, in that, um, in that book, draw lessons from these stories about Jesuits that were relevant to any of us, no matter what we're doing, and that helped to um, 
to point out values that any of us could role model to embody leadership in our life and work. And so the book is built around these four ideas to be heroic and loving and self-aware and ingenious. And I guess that in your uh, Jesuit college, uh, you probably didn't have the word heroic uh, thrown at you a lot. Uh, so I also put in parentheses, um, in a way, the code, you know, the Jesuit um, ideas that I drew from and tried to translate into an everyday way of living and working. Uh, so in other words, I use a word like loving, meaning to treat each person as dignified and worthy of respect. And in Jesuit speak, you might understand that as the idea of corrupt personalis and so on. So, um, uh, you know, the, the general message is that, yeah, you know, life has given each of us a leadership opportunity responsibility. And then maybe more particularly, the Jesuit tradition that Alpha Sigma Nu embodies has particular ideas rooted in the Jesuit tradition concerning what this might look like, you know, what kinds of leadership we might live. And on the next slide, Andrea, uh, I'm not gonna go through these four ideas one by one. Uh, rather, I'd like to tell a couple of stories and use those to illustrate how we might show leadership in the VUCA environment inspired by our Jesuit tradition. Um, there's a story about uh, doing the laundry and unloading your baggage and taking a pit stop. And I have one eye on my clock and I might or might not get all through all three of these in the core in the half hour, but I'll start through it and um, if, if I have to skip one in order to make the time, I'll, I'll do that because I wanna be respectful of your time. And on the next slide, Andrea, um, instead of these three photos as an agenda, uh, this slide kind of translates what I've said so far and those photos into a kind of agenda, um, if you will, an invitation uh, for what kind of leadership, how you might show leadership in a VUCA environment. First, I've already spoken about that idea. Could you embrace the leadership opportunity and responsibility that life gives you? Second, I'm gonna talk next about this one. Could we keep improving our leadership skills all the time? Third, could we become better decision makers, more discerning in Jesuit speak? And can we cultivate a habit of reflection? And um, the last idea, these kinds of things only happen with courage. So let's talk first about uh, this idea of improving your own leadership skills. And the next page has uh, a photo that's an icon for a story that'll uh, help uh, us to get into it. Um, and uh, we'll move to the next slide, Andrea, perfect. And um, this is a story about Pope Francis. I couldn't find a picture of Pope Francis doing the laundry, so this photo will have to be the stand-in. And first, let me tell you a little story. Um, I wrote a book about him not long after he was elected Pope. And as I was preparing that book for stories about him, and, and one of them told me this story that at one time, uh, Bergoglio, then Bergoglio, before Pope Francis, was put in charge of a seminary of the Jesuits that was in terrible financial condition. And he had a meeting of the seminarians and said, um, you know, we can't afford to pay people to come in here and do the law and uh, clean up our dishes and clean the hallways. We're gonna have to start doing these tasks for ourselves. And he says, I'll do the laundry. That'll be my job. And the guys who told me this story said that in those days, if you had gone at 5.30 in the morning into the basement of the seminary building, you would have seen Bergoglio throwing people's dirty underwear and, and so on into a couple of industrial washing machines. And it struck me that the, the, the question I had asked them was not, tell me something that will make me believe this guy is holy or nice. My question was, tell me something about this guy as a leader. 
And in a way, it was a strange answer, you know, because I guess if I asked you folks, tell me something about your boss as a leader, a lot of people would say things like, oh, you know, she's really good at uh, addressing a problem and having a meeting and getting us organized to tackle it or something. And a couple of these guys instead say, he did the laundry. And to tell you the truth, what went through my mind as they told me uh, this story and why they associated it with leadership was a definition of leadership that a branch of the Air Force used to use, and it's on the next slide, Andrea. Uh, and they used to say that leadership is the art of influencing, directing people in such a way that will win their obedience, confidence, respect, and cooperation, achieving objectives. And without knowing this definition, obviously, without having these words, I feel like what these guys were somehow saying to me was, you know something, Chris? When this guy stood up there and said, we've got a sacrifice, and instead of exempting myself from the sacrifice I ask of you, I'm going to go first. I'll do the laundry. When he said that, that really won my respect. It won my cooperation. It made me want to be on the guy's team. Um, in a way, I felt like they were channeling this, this definition. And let me tell you that um, a lot of times when people take their first management job, especially, they get the first part of this definition. Oh, I have to direct people. I have to tell people what to do. They get the last part of the definition. Management leadership has something to do with achieving goals and objectives. But they totally skip over this crucial middle part that good leadership, especially when you're starting, has something to do with winning the confidence, respect, and cooperation of your colleagues and teammates. Um, and this part of, part of leadership, I think is all the more important in today's VUCA world where there's so much complexity and such lack of clarity into the future that it's sometimes very hard to be able to give people the super clear roadmap and directions that they want. So if you follow where I'm going, since we can't give them sometimes super clear roadmaps, we need to improve our other leadership skills, winning confidence and cooperation, in order to keep people with us on the journey. And here's some good news. Let me tie it. Uh, as I've been doing throughout, let me tie it to your uh, Jesuit Alpha Sigma Nu tradition. I think your tradition is giving you some wonderful uh, value prompts that is going to help you to do this work really well, this work of winning confidence and respect and cooperation. Um, so you'll remember a couple of slides ago, I talked about loving leadership and you know, that's a strange kind of a word in corporate life. But if I asked you to write down what does a loving leader behave like or what does it look like in an organizational setting, I bet that you would come up with a set of behaviors and actions that are a lot like what's on the next slide, Andrea. And this is a piece of a McKinsey piece of research where they went out and they asked uh, their corporate clients to give them uh, insights into some of the behaviors that worked well among their most effective leaders. And I've excerpted on this page about half of the behaviors that McKinsey put in that article and just skim down this list. I suspect that these are the kind of things that you or I would say amount to loving leadership. Be supportive, develop other people, give praise, facilitate collaboration, on and on. The kind of stuff that sometimes gets pushed aside or dismissed as, oh, that's the soft stuff. 
It's kind of nice to do. It's not really the most important things. And here you're getting validation from McKinsey, speaking from the corporate world, that actually these things are incredibly important for effective leadership. And you're also getting affirmation from me that you know something, uh, some of these things are incredibly uh, tied to the Jesuit tradition you were all educated in. Uh, Andrea, I'm gonna ask you to skip one slide now and go to the third, one more, perfect. And you know, to harvest one other thing from this doing the laundry story, we might say that it's kind of a, a, an example of servant leadership. And many of you know this idea, uh, but in a nutshell, the idea of servant leadership is that, you know, instead of subconsciously behaving as if the people on the team are serving me uh, to help get my objectives done, I will understand my job as serving them. Not in the sense of doing their laundry, but in the sense of trying to um, uh, do what I need to do in ways that will help them perform at their best. And here I have a great quote from uh, Mike Tomlin, the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, coach. Sorry for all you Texans fans, um, but it's a good quote. And he was asked once to talk about how he understands his work as a coach, his job. And look what he says, every day when I go to work, I think about the things I can do to make my men, make my team successful. So I have a servant's mentality in terms of how I approach my job. Can I think of my job as somehow in the same frame as Tomlin and the frame of the last few slides? What am I doing that wins the respect and cooperation of, of my team uh, by um, helping them to develop to their best uh, and so on. Uh, okay, so this is our, our second big, our first idea. Everybody needs to embrace their opportunity. Our second big idea, and you need not only to embrace your leadership opportunity, but keep working on your leadership skills. And that moves us to the next idea, Andrea, on the next slide, we all need to become better, more discerning decision makers and change leaders. Um, once again, everything is tied to VUCA. We have to be better decision makers because if things are changing a lot around us, then we ourselves are going to also need to change from time to time. In organizational life, maybe our strategic direction in personal life, maybe the ways we do our job, what we learn and so on. Um, if you want a nice little shorthand explanation of why it's important to be a good decision maker and adaptable to change, it comes on the next page. Uh, next, yeah, thank you. Uh, so here's from that great philosopher, Mike Tyson. Uh, early in his career when he was still kind of um, unbeatable. Uh, a reporter once asked him about an upcoming fight. Uh, oh, Mr. Tyson, so-and-so says he has a plan to defeat you. So what do you say to that? And Tyson goes, everybody's got a plan till they get punched in the face. And okay, it's a violent image, but I put it here because metaphorically, life in a VUCA world keeps punching us in the face. COVID was a punch in the face. We all got knocked down and we all had to figure out, I have to change to react to this VUCA. Inflation was a punch in the face. Either managing our own budget or our organizational life, we had to figure out how to do things differently. And I feel like our Jesuit tradition, once again, is giving us some wonderful VUCA relevant tools for doing this task of leadership. Uh, the next slide, Andrea, will give a visual image. I say to people, if you wanna be a, a good change maker, open to making decisions uh, to go in new directions or change what needs to be changed, you've gotta unload your inner baggage. And 
when I use this image, I'm kind of riffing on an idea of St. Ignatius from his spiritual exercises. A lot of you, I've, I'm sure, have heard of the spiritual exercises. And it's a religious retreat, of course. But it's also a kind of a decision-making manual. And one of Ignatius' great insights that I think is badly uh, undervalued, it doesn't get enough attention, is that he says, you know, like a lot of times in life, we get into trouble and we make the wrong decisions, not because we don't have enough facts or information or legal advice or accounting advice or whatever the heck it may be in the modern era. We get into trouble rather because we're so unfree in his words. We have so many internal hangups. Hang he calls them inordinate attachments, unhealthy attachments. And these attachments, these inner unfreedoms are kind of enslaving us and uh, making us not open enough to be able to entertain the direction in which we should go. If that sounds a little abstract, the next slide, Andrea has a list of a few uh, examples, by no means the only one. Each of us has our own demons. My demons are not yours and yours are not mine. But these are the kinds of things that sometimes trip individuals and, or, and organizations and teams up when they're faced with decisions that require them to be open to change. So we might be attached to, for example, the fear of trying something new or the impulse to do what other people are doing, or attachments the way it's always been done before, or our own need to be in control or to win. In other words, I'm part of a team and we're trying to discuss where should we go now. And I find myself resisting, objecting to every idea that a colleague comes up with. And I'm not aware of it maybe, but at some subconscious level, what's really going on is let's say my own power or ego or control issues or need to win is getting in the way, enslaving me, uh, rendering me unfree to really make a good choice. Uh, so there are lots of ingredients that go into making good choices, uh, but your Jesuit Alpha Sigma Nu tradition, once again, is giving you a, a tool to help with, with VUCA. Um, I'm a little bit over time already. I'm just gonna take two minutes to talk about one last idea, then we can have open discussion. Um, and I wanna talk about this idea of a daily habit of reflection, which is the fourth uh, bullet point there. And uh, probably from your Jesuit school days, you remember hearing the word examine tossed around. A lot of Jesuit schools try to promote this. and it's always, almost always promoted in a religious sense. And that's great. That's how Ignatius intended it. But I try to point out that it has very powerful human payoffs, especially in VUCA world. Let's go forward, Andrea, uh, and stay here. Uh, so focus on the image first. Uh, which I'll use to illustrate my point. No Formula One or NASCAR driver would be stupid enough to try to go through a 500 mile race without ever stopping for fuel or to change tires. And metaphorically, we're like these stupid drivers who are trying to go all day without ever taking what I would call as a mental, reflective, prayerful, if you want, pit stop, to take stock of what's gone on in the day so far. And so I say to folks, whether or not you're in the Christian tradition, whether or not you're even religious, it still makes sense to do some humanistic form of this Ignatian examine. And uh, for example, you could pick out one or two times a day at right after lunch, when I'm driving home from work or before I go to bed, I'm gonna take two or three minutes. During these two or three minutes, no 
social media, no music, no phone calls, no distractions, just me and my higher powers. I understand that. And first, I'm going to try to be grateful. I spend the whole day thinking about problems. Now, let me just be grateful for a few seconds. And then second, lift my horizon. In other words, not going through as I typically do the whole day with my horizon three inches in front of me. This is the call I have to return. This is what I want for lunch. This is what I have to do next. Instead, for a few seconds, a much bigger horizon. Why am I doing this with my life? Why am I here on earth anyway? And then third, mentally review the day so far. Revisit those meetings, revisit the work I was doing, try to take away some little lesson that might uh, help me uh, in the next few hours. Like if I wasn't my best self or the self I could be proud of in the last few hours, what was going wrong and how could I adjust that? And I think the genius of this very simple process becomes so obvious when we think about the world we're all living in. We're kind of floating along on this river of email, meeting, phone call, social media, distraction, text. I'm 100% present to every idiotic, random distraction that crosses my radar. The only thing I'm not really present to, on the other hand, is actually what's ultimately important. What's going on deep inside me? What's most important in life? What's my relationship with the higher powers? I understand it. And this very simple tool uh, gives you a, a nice way of recollecting yourself amidst the VUCA chaos and getting yourself back on track. Andre, I think I'm gonna stop now because I want us to um, leave a good chunk of time uh, for any comments or questions. If we end up with a couple of minutes afterward, uh, before we finish up, I could always go back to the last slide or two, but for now, let's just have open forum. All comments welcome, all questions most welcome. Thank you, Chris. And I invite you to raise your hand with the raise hand icon to ask your questions. I'll be happy to send you the invitation and open your microphone. So in the meantime, Chris, I have a question here. That says, you have extensive intercultural experience. How does the Jesuit stuff impact different cultures? Is it the same for all the worldviews? What do you have seen there? Okay, it's a nice, it's a nice question that I've never thought about explicitly. So let me think for a few seconds before just saying something. Um, you know, my core instinct is to say that, uh, that the ideas of Ignatius, because, you know, in, in many ways, they're fundamentally humanistic also, do translate fairly well across cultures, you know. And in fact, um, in, the, in the book, uh, in Heroic Leadership, I tell stories, a big chunk of the book are stories of Jesuits in the 1500s who are really among the very first Europeans to go to parts of South America, parts of India, parts of the Far East, China and Japan. And, you know, in a 21st century lens, we would say, oh man, I'm not exactly sure about how they interact. Um, it, it, they weren't colonials, but there's a little bit of, of, of that. Uh, but if we put on our 16th, 17th, even 18th century hats, maybe our 19th century hats, it's amazing what these, how these guys interact as human beings, you know? And to me, I take that as a testament that the, I, the core ideas somehow cross cultures, you know? Uh, the, the other thing I'd say, which was not really what the questioner raised, but I think it's an interesting thing for the Jesuit tradition and world is, you know, when the Jesuits were starting, a lot of these schools, even in the United States, even up to like a, a, a little after World War II, it was a very homogenous Catholic world. And frankly, it was also a homogeneously uh, white world to a certain extent. Um, and so people used to talk, talk about these things, taking for granted 
a kind of a Catholic culture. And I think the challenge for a lot of us in the course of these last 40 and 50 years, and frankly, I think people have met this challenge very well, is to think about, oh man, you know, how do we take some of these ideas that um, were often expressed in a Christian language, but that may have very deep humanistic roots and be widely relevant, how do we take these ideas and translate them into language that, you know, my brothers and sisters who are now studying with me or in my class from all different and no particular religious tradition can resonate with them. Thank you, Chris. Okay, let's go with the second question. You all are invited to raise your hand using the raise hand icon or chatting, writing your question in the chat section or in the Q&A section, either way. Chris, what does micromanagement show when we talk about leadership and Jesuit values? Micromanagement? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, so look, um, I'm type A and I think a lot of people who end up in Alpha Sigma Nu are also type A because you're achievers and that's how you get ahead and things and that's the way your head works. And, you know, so therefore we're all also micromanagers, you know, like we say all these great things about uh, delegation and empowering teams, but then somebody does something different than the way we want to do it. And, oh man, it's a big problem. And, you know, that was a, a big personal challenge for me, you know, to try to let go of that. And um, I think, look, I mean, I could say bad things about Ignatius and the Jesuit tradition where I think it's warranted. But in this case, I think also you have to give him high marks. Um, people who've read heroic leadership, um, I, and I could, if you want to email me after, I could direct you to some of his letters where he would write these letters, Ignatius would write these letters basically to people in different continents, different countries, and they'd be phrases like, well, you know, this is, how, this is what I might do, but you who are on the ground will know better what's to do. So just do what you think is best. And man, I mean, micromanagement is a late 20th century concept and that this guy in the 1500s could have had that impulse is really amazing, you know? And I guess for him, it must be connected to some religious idea that was very important to him that, uh, you know, each of us is given many gifts and we're each somehow called and maybe part of your job as a leader is not to tell people what to do, but to enable them to uh, embody their calling and, and use their gifts. Um, so yeah, I think the tradition can help us to avoid being micromanagers and to do that job, that task of leadership well. Chris, thank you. And uh, I have Elena and then Brian. Elena, hi. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Yes, we can. Um, well, yes, my name is Elena Perez Velasco. I'm calling from Brussels, but I'm originated from Spain. And I'm super happy to be in this call today. Thank you so much. My question actually had two, then you can choose which one would you like to answer. Uh, the first one is, um, what about the people who say that they are not leaders or that they firmly believe that they are not leaders because, you know, they or also like people who believe there are other people who are not leaders because they're just living, they're flowing around in this world. So they don't have this drive. They don't really, um, you know, just like living each day and that's all. Then what would you say to them? And should we accept the fact that they are not leaders in this world? Um, and then the second question would be um, is being a leader you know, having this servant's mentality, then it means that your work is your responsibility. So you have like challenges, uh, you have to perform, um, you have to do it the best you can, you know, using matches um, as your daily motto and so. Uh, but then how, what advice would you give to someone who is seeking to be free 
in in this um, you know uh, net or web of responsibilities and high achiever. Okay, so how about if I, since you gave me a choice, how about if I choose the first one, <laughs> and then if we have time, of course you, we could come back to the second one. Um, so it's a great, it's a very important question because it gives me a chance to hammer home what I think is the most important point I made early on. Um, so you say, what about people who would say, oh no, you know, I'm not a leader actually. And that would be almost everybody. You know, I've never, I, you know, I worked, when I worked in JP Morgan, there were like 20,000 people. Now there's 200 plus thousand. And I don't know, I guess if, if you asked 19,500 of us whose leaders Everybody would have said Sandy Warner, you know, it's just the way human beings are. And to me, this is exactly the problem we have to get over, you know, and um, first, let me put it in a VUCA context, because that's how I framed everything uh, today. If you get into an environment where everything is slow, everything is completely straightforward, maybe one person can carry much of the load of leadership. You know, there's plenty of time to uh, make all the decisions. Uh, nothing's too complicated. I could figure everything out. But as soon as you get into a world like today, that model is complete craziness. There's no way that any organization survives with so much going on, with so much change, so much complexity, unless each person at their own level is kind of stepping up and saying, okay, you know, this is my sandbox here and I have to show leadership here. And so from a VUCA case, we really need people to behave this way. And companies will say that now, you know, they, they may not use the idea of VUCA, but they'll say, oh, we need you to show leadership. Uh, now, the second way I try to emphasize it would be recalling these dictionary ideas that I share, you know, that leadership has something to do with pointing the way. In other, we tend to stereotypically think of leadership as meaning only to be in charge of everything. That's a definition in the dictionary, but it's only one of many definitions. And this other, I think, richer definition that leadership has something to do with what am I role modeling? What way am I pointing out? What influence am I having? That applies to everybody, of course. Uh, I mean, to cite the most obvious, all of us have parents. Many of the folks on this call are parents. I mean, that's the most obvious example of pointing away and influencing others. So to me, um, well, I'll say one last thing. Um, you know, I totally get, and Elena, you were probably getting at this, that when we think of leadership in this other stereotypical hierarchical way, some of us have more gifts than others that are relevant to that. You know, like some people are just more comfortable speaking in a group, standing in front of a group or whatever it may be. Uh, so that is true if we're talking only about this stereotypical hierarchical stereotype. And I guess the point I really wanna emphasize is when somebody says, oh, I'm not a leader, blah, blah, blah. You know, I think what we could do for them or for ourselves is to say, oh, wait a minute. You know, we need to lose this unhealthy stereotype that associates leadership only with hierarchy and think about leadership in this more fundamental way and in that more fundamental way, of course it has to do with me. And so now the question is only, all right, what's my playing field right now? It's, I don't know what, this family, this little team that I manage, or these three clients and vendors I interact with, or this room of students I deal with, you know, what's my playing field? And how am I using the leadership opportunity and responsibility I have? Thank you, Chris. Brian. Okay, thank you. You had to unmute me. Um, uh, you in part answered uh, part of what I want to ask, because when I think about leadership, if you Google the word, 
we seem to have a lot of content regarding what a leader does, but less about who in terms of embodiment. And that's a yeah. big challenge that I'm seeing. I'm a foreign immigrant physician. And so I think about healthcare, you know, they're slow to change. But when I look again at leadership dynamics in terms of the structure and how that impacts people's behavior, we seem to point the finger at what, but it gives less accountability for who. And so that's a big challenge when you talk about VUCA. So I think some industries are probably more impacted than others. But I wonder, can you talk about that? Because it seems like it's such an anomaly to to actually discuss this idea of who. And I think about Peter Drucker that says leadership is synonymous with becoming oneself. And again, yeah, yeah. about that a lot. Yeah, that, that's a great observation. Um, yeah, that's a great observation. And I totally agree with what you're implying there, you know, and I don't know that I can totally um, diagnose it, so to speak. My instinct is that given the nature of corporate life in general and the pressures, especially that people feel in these kinds of environments, which are not easily easy in most businesses, um, there's this kind of pull always toward actions, results, and therefore that leads into, this is what you do, these are the tasks and so on. But I think the point that you're putting your finger on, uh, Brian, is if there's not a who behind these things, then pardon my language, it's bullshit, you know? And we all know that, you know? Um, we used to have this phrase in my work in life about some people, oh man, this guy's an empty suit. You know, in other words, you know, he stands up there. And in those days, a lot of times it was he. Um, he stands up there and words come out of his mouth, but we're sitting here feeling there's nothing to this person, you know, or it's an act. They don't actually believe what they're talking about. And, you know, so we all become cynical and we kind of check out and so on. So I think you're totally right. You know, the who does come first. And I think you're also right that you might not necessarily hear that in the workplace, you know, uh, they may lead with the what. Uh, and I think in a way that's one of the virtues of, of uh, a community like this or something, you know, that it kind of helps us to uh, dissect, oh, you know, this is what, what's going on, this is what I'm hearing how does this feel and sound to us? Does this sound real? Does this sound authentic? What what would better, you know, we, we have to bring that, what, what you described, Brian, sometimes we're gonna have to bring that rather than have our corporate masters draw that out of us. Thank Excellent. you, Chris. Thank you. Now, I saw a comment that Clara made in the chat. I don't know, Clara, if you would like to elaborate more on that. Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Clara Dwyer. Just as a quick introduction, I'm the executive director of Alpha Sigma Nu. Uh, I'm about 17 months in the role, and I am so excited to see this attendance. Andrea, first, thank you so much for convening all of them, everybody, along with uh, Chris here. Um, it's always uh, a treat to have you, Chris, be a part of um, our events and our programs. And Andrea, mm -hmm. thank you for being a leader in, in doing this. Um, what I said was, uh, and I'm not going to read it because I, I actually, I'm like, I have a lot of buttons going on on my screen and I'm calling from Santa Clara where I am, you know, here for a uh, chief mission officer meeting. Um, so I apologize for any background noise and all of the people walking around behind me. Uh, but, um, what I said was that, you know, our tenants of Alpha Sigma Nu are scholarship, loyalty, and service. But what I've been encountering through my interactions, um, and I was a part of Alpha Sigma Nu prior to this role, so I worked at Marquette University and I worked with the student members. What I encounter regularly, consistently, is that our students, our members, have an innate sense of leadership. You know, even when they think they're being followers, they're being leaders, right? They know how to get the job done. I mm. think that that is something that I am amazed by. You know, in spreading the the, the good word, um, in uh, uh, living the mission uh, in everything they do, um, having a, 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 a um, 
ethos or uh, the virtue of um, uh, paying attention to and giving preference to the poor, working and alongside and walking with those on the marginalized, caring for our common home. And I'm, I'm starting to recite some of these universal apostolic preferences. And I find that our it comes very naturally for the, for the members of Alpha Sigma Nu. Yes, they are type A achievers, but they are servant leaders as well. So that's what I, I think, you know, just to elaborate a little bit, I could go on and on because I really feel blessed to be in this role because it really feels, and I graduated from Santa Clara and Jesuit education has been a key part of who I've become. Um, but that that this work is so important um, and I can only do it because we have leaders as our membership. Yeah, I, I might comment on that just a, a little bit and more generally. So, um, you know, again, just to go right back to the dictionary, leadership has something to do with pointing away and having influence. And, you know, I think what Clara just described is we have certain ideas about how we want to lead as folks who are part of the Alpha Sigma Nu community, you know, so you're, it is a leadership statement in a way. This is what's important to us. This is what we want to promote and so on. So that's one comment I want to make. And, you know, the second more general comment, I've, I've said this to Amy and Clara, um, you know, I'm a big Alpha Sigma Nu fan. And when I was in, I went to four, I was a Jesuit when I went to Fordham, a seminarian. And so, you know, when I was graduating, I was invited to join Alpha Sigma Nu. I didn't reply. It was like this sleepy, I mean, I, nobody knew what the heck it was. And like, to me, it was like these things I would see in these uh, like Animal House movies about, you know, I just knew Greek things. And, you know, where it's come in these last 20, 30 years, maybe last 10, especially, I mean, it's just an amazing story. And I feel like, You've kind of you you are have a wonderful um, sweet spot right now in where the Jesuit world needs to go. Uh, like in other words, it's cross cultural, it's cross universal, cross university. It's attending to people after they graduate. It's calling to people to something bigger than just get a job and so on. So I feel like you have it's a really great moment, and I um, as obviously Amy and Clara know, uh, you know, you, there's a, a helped participate in a leadership program that Alpha Sigma Nu does with some uh, of the folks. And I just think it, for many reasons, it's a really great, it's a, it's a great moment for Alpha Sigma Nu. Thank you, Chris. And in the last minute that we have here, Amy would like to ask a question about heroic leadership, I think. Well, I wanted to just make sure everybody knew um, some of this stemmed from Andrea and myself actually participating in a program that Alpha Sigma Nu offered last year. And we're offering it again in partnership with Santa Clara. Where Santa Clara seems to be the theme of the day today, but the Santa Clara's Levy School of Business in 2024. And it's a program Chris was uh, is brought to life um, called Heroic Leadership for All. Uh, it's, it's now an eight week uh, program next year and we offer a reduced rate for Alpha Sigma Nu members. And so I put the link in the chat box. You can also find it on our website, but this would be a great group if you want to hear more from Chris on the Jesuit stuff and as it pertains to leadership, it would be a great opportunity for you. So just wanted to plug that. Chris, thank you. And thank you, Amy. I have one more question for you that probably will take these 30 seconds. In the context of Buka, what is the question you would like to be asked more often? You mean if I do a presentation like this, what question would I? Yeah, like what yeah. is the question that you would love to have more often? Um, well, you know, look, when you say it, there's a question that comes to my mind, but it's not a question I would like to be asked, you know, which is, so I, the, what I did is, uh, as, as you remember very well, I said, okay, look, here's the world that has implications for leadership and your Jesuit stuff is gonna help you cope and lead well in these environments. But I mean, to me as a human being, a question is where is all this VUCA leading? The, I mean, remember I put up this slide with the nature of some of the trends in society and, you know, 
there are things that I think are wonderful in the world. There are also things that are very, I, I don't know what, discouraging among many other things. And yeah, that weighs on me a little bit and I suspect that weighs on a number of you also. So I'm glad nobody asked me that question, Andrea, but that's a question that comes to my mind. Where, you know, where, what is society's trajectory and how should we feel about that? And what can we do about that? Where we feel like we're small, we have small levers against some very big problems. Chris, thank you. And I need to insist, you're a rock star of leadership and decision-making. I understand you won't get it <laughs> because we, we, we really enjoy talking to you. We hope to have more events like this with you. And thank you. Thank you so much. Gracias for joining us today. What a wonderful lunchtime session to feed our mind, soul, hearts, and of course, Chris. Thank you. Thank you again. Happy Wednesday. That's my pleasure. And you did it in exactly one hour. <laughs>